Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. Do want to hit on here right now is Texas A&M. Texas A&M hosted Florida. Texas A&M gets a signature win, but it's more than just a win. It is much, much, much more if you're both Jimbo Fisher or an Aggies fan. And to give you a little backstory, it really goes back to what we talked about last week. Jimbo Fisher is now in year three at Texas A&M, and for the most part, he has largely been pretty good, right? Wins nine games the first year, goes eight and five last year. Um, and for the most part, just like he takes care of the teams that he's supposed to. He beats the Mississippi States and the old Misses and the schools like that. But it, the issue has been how he has fared against the really good teams. And it's one thing if you're not getting it done in year one. It's one thing if you're not getting it done in year two. But year three, the issue came last Saturday in Tuscaloosa. Because when it's year three, and you're getting paid what Jimbo Fisher is getting paid, you can't lose by four touchdowns to Alabama because what it makes it look like is the gap between the good teams and the bad teams is actually growing, and it should be shrinking if you're paying Jimbo Fisher what you're paying him. And that is where the issue kind of comes in. And I mentioned it last week, but it is important for the context of this conversation, and that's that Jimbo Fisher is getting paid a lot of money, right? Like every college football coach in America, especially at the Power 5 level, gets paid well. Jimbo Fisher is one of the most insane contracts I've ever seen. To get him away from Florida State, and I don't blame Texas A&M, you got to pay what you have to pay to get a really good coach. Jimbo Fisher got a fully guaranteed 10-year, $75 million contract. Fully guaranteed means that if Jimbo Fisher just stinks, if Jimbo Fisher were to lose every game this year, every game next year goes 0-12, and they have to fire him because he stinks, they would still owe him all $75 million dollars for that entire contract for his entire salary. And so when you're getting paid that much, it feels good to win nine games. It feels good to win eight games. But at some point, you got to beat somebody worth your salt. And when you're coming off a loss to Alabama, a lot of people are questioning, are we going to be stuck in perpetuity just beating the bad teams and losing to the good teams? Well, as we found out on Saturday, that is not the case as Texas A&M beats Florida, last second field goal, and they win that game 41-38. to uh, First of all, a couple things. First of all, shout out to A&M fans because, and I know A&M fans are going to get mad at me for saying this, but uh, it was kind of funny. There was no way that stadium was at 25% capacity. Now, I'm somebody, I think we should be opening things up more, so if it was at 40%, 35%, I think that that's fine with me. But there was no way it was at 25%. A&M fans will tell you that's nonsense, it's media, it's fake news. That stadium was not at 25%. But they were loud. They influenced the game. And what's crazy is if you reflect back on the game, it's kind of what I said a minute ago with Clemson. It's not as though A&M in beating Florida even played their best game. Now, you can say the same about Florida, but when you watch the game, if you watch the game, and there was a lot going on, especially in that noon window, but A&M falls down early, can't get a defensive stop early, and is largely beating themselves with penalty after penalty after penalty every time they think they have a drive stopped. Another dumb penalty, excuse me, that keeps the Florida drive going. They score touchdowns, this, that. There's an interception that gets called back because of a dumb penalty. And so the game to me changed late in the third quarter when Florida went up 28-17. to And what happened at that point was very simply this. The play before there was really a kind of a dirty play from a Florida player, kind of shoved a, a, a Texas A&M player, kind of, uh, you know, when he was standing in the middle of the pile. I actually thought it was a little undercover during the game. I felt like the guys talking about the game could have talked about it more because he really could have hurt, and hurt the poor kid at Texas A&M. But then one of the Texas A&M kids comes in and shoves the guy who shoved the first guy. And so it's offsetting penalties. Jimbo Fisher freaks out. And the next play... Kyle Trask throws a bomb to go up 28 to 17. And that was the moment where you're kind of, if you're watching the game, probably I'm guessing AM fans who do listen to this show, you can check in with me. But that's probably where you're like, oh, here we go again. We're undisciplined, can't get off the field, can't make plays on offense. We suck. 
And you know who else probably felt that way, honestly? Was Jimbo Fisher. Because they cut to the sidelines. Jimbo Fisher is going ballistic on his players. It's unacceptable. I don't know what he said, but it's unacceptable. It doesn't, you got to be better than this, this, that, the other thing. And then a funny thing happened. After Jimbo Fisher chewed Texas A&M out, they were phenomenal. Next series, how about this? 19 play, 76 yard drive. And on that 19 play, 76 yard drive, 17 plays were rushing plays. And so essentially what happened was this. Texas A&M lined up. Jimbo Fisher told his guys, get tough, get physical. Let's beat these guys up because we're better than them and we're not losing this game. And the Texas A&M players, to their credit, responded. They got physical. They dominated the line of scrimmage. They ran the ball at will. And they cut the lead from 28-17 to 28-24. A&M gets a defensive stop. And then the next series, that's the one where Isaiah Spiller... Their star running back just trucks a dude into the end zone to score what was eventually what was a go-ahead touchdown and what essentially was the touchdown that helped them win the game. AM kicks a last second field goal, they celebrate, and AM finally has their signature victory. And so when I look back on Saturday, a couple different thoughts on the game itself. The first one is I'm just happy for everybody at AM, right? Like we're all fans of somebody, and AM you know, they've been knocking on this door for a while now. I know they had their, their, the highs of the Johnny Manziel season in 2013, but I was happy for them. I was happy for the players. It's clear the players are working hard. It's clear they believe in Jimbo Fisher, but they just hadn't had that breakthrough moment yet. I was also happy for Kellen Mond. Kellen Mond, their quarterback, who's taken nothing but crap because he can't beat Tua, because he can't beat Trevor Lawrence, because he can't beat Joe Burrow, and that's not a knock on him because nobody's beating those guys. So I'm happy for them. I'm obviously happy for the fans. Shout out to the quote-unquote 25% of you that were at the stadium. There's a lot more than that, but whatever. I I love you guys, Aggies fans. Don't be mad at me. But then the second thing is, you know who else I'm kind of happy for? I'm actually happy for Jimbo Fisher. And look, I I understand there's no sympathy for a guy who's getting paid $75 million guaranteed to coach a college football team. I get that. I understand that. I don't feel bad for him necessarily, but I do think the narrative that like he couldn't beat anybody was a little bit overblown. The Alabama games were bad, yes, but a lot of people look bad against Alabama. Ironically, only Lane Kiffin's the one that has been figured out, but neither here nor there. But that's one. Two, he just kind of was he he didn't look good against Bama, but he also had the disadvantage of like he just kind of got screwed on the schedule. I mean, years ago, AM schedules a home and home with Clemson, and that home and home coincides with with him arriving at Texas AM. So he finally gets away from Dabo and Clemson in the ACC when he was at Florida State, only to get to AM and have to play them twice. And when you look at his resume, he's now 19 and 10 overall at AM, but seven of those 10 losses were to top four teams in the country. And so if Jimbo Fisher, if 10 years ago when AM scheduled the home and home with Clemson, if they had just scheduled instead of Clemson, if they had scheduled Pitt or Boston College or. Wake Forest, or literally any team in the ACC except for Clemson, Jimbo probably has two more wins on his resume. He wins 10 games his first year, nine games his second year, and it's a completely different narrative. Not to mention, he got screwed because it happened that he had the crossover game with Georgia last year, so he had to go to Georgia, almost beat Georgia at Georgia, and you take that game off if you have Vandy instead of Georgia in that given year, or if you get Georgia at home, maybe it's a different deal. We might be talking about back-to-back 10-win season. So I don't believe that this guy forgot how to coach. I just believe he's been at a disadvantage with the schedule. What I would also say is what Kellen Mond said after the game, which is that right there, that might be the signature win that turns around the program at Texas A&M. Because if you look at what happened, one, they beat a really good team. And two, they, identi- they, they created an identity. They are now physical and tough and run the ball, and they're going to use play action. I get that. But it's also like they kind of showed like, you know, we can, we can get physical and we kind of have an identity, and they need to have that balance and th- to have success. But I think they will. If you could push around Florida, you could basically push around anybody, right? And it's kind of funny because 
I do think that when you look at the rest of the schedule, it's crazy how quickly stuff changes in college football, right? Last week, it was Jimbo can't beat anybody. He's terrible. He's this. He's that. A&M. They're never going to get over the hump. And now you look at it, and it's kind of the exact opposite. All of a sudden, LSU, who we're going to get into in a minute, looks terrible. And all of a sudden, you look at that LSU game, and you say, I don't know. I think they could beat LSU. They get LSU at home. Not only do I think they can beat LSU, I think they will beat LSU. Auburn looks terrible. I'm sorry, Auburn fans. I know you think that I hate you. I don't. I just don't think your team's very good. We're going to talk about Auburn in a second, too. They play Arkansas, who's good, but let's be honest, they should be favored against Arkansas. They play Mississippi State, who's struggling. They play South Carolina, who's struggling. And so when I look at this team, I think the toughest game left on their schedule is like at Tennessee, A&M should be favored maybe at Tennessee. And all of a sudden, you're talking about a team that a minute ago, we were ready to throw dirt on their grave. Now, I think it's very realistic they go 9-1. and one. They would still need some help to get to the SEC championship game. But I don't think it's inconceivable that if they finish 9-1, and one, that they have a shot at that college football playoff because of how everything else is going to break down. Georgia's obviously going to have at least a loss or two. Alabama's going to have a loss or two. Of course, Alabama would have the dominant win over Texas, but Texas A&M would have the head-to-head win over Florida. So it is just amazing how quickly things turn in college football.